Welcome, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. Ami Sepquilam. Welcome in American Sign Language. It is wonderful, as so many have said already, to be gathered here, 500 plus people, maskless. It's funny, you know, I put on a jacket this morning because it was kind of crummy weather. And normally when I put on a jacket that I haven't worn for a long time, you put your hand in the pocket and there's maybe a $20 bill, an old lozenge, but no, there was two masks, uh, right? <laughs> uh, we're gonna find that for, uh, for quite some time. I really wanna thank uh, Chief Sparrow for coming out and uh, giving us a welcome, welcoming us to this uh, privileged place that we gather on and also acknowledging the significant partnership that YVR has uh, with Musqueam. It's so important that we keep those relationships going, we deepen them, and I thank him particularly, given how busy a day it was today, for starting us out in a good way. We at YVR too are disappointed with the province's decision not to support the 2030 bid. We were big proponents uh, in support of Musqueam and the other Indigenous nations. I also want to thank Brian. Brian, as you probably heard, is also a friend as well as a colleague. I didn't think my chat uh, group conversation would make it into the address, but thank you for keeping it real and humble and uh, connected. Stantec's such an important partner with us. As you can see, they've been integral in building the fantastic facilities that we come to know and love at YVR. We also are very privileged to have so many supporters and and sponsors in the audience, I really, really appreciate you coming out today, and of course, your ongoing support for the work that we do at YVR. And Cindy, thank you very much for being on stage with me today. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate uh, you providing that accessibility. So what we have gathered here today is, I think, in many ways, the best of our province. Business leaders that I've had the opportunity to work with throughout my career and say hello to again as you came in the room here this afternoon, you represent the best of our province. You're diverse, you're innovative, you're resilient, you're committed to thinking about the future. And so I think it's absolutely appropriate that we would be here to have this first conversation in quite a few years, three now, uh, at YVR talking about our plans, for growth and connection with all of you, so much a part of our collective success. As I think you know, my name is Tamara Vrooman, and I am the person who chose to become the CEO of the second largest airport in Canada in the midst of a global pandemic. Now, I've never been one to shy away from a challenge, and as you heard, that, that perspective has allowed me to have a very diverse uh, and interesting career. I've been privileged to serve as the Deputy Minister of Health and the Deputy Minister of Finance, the CEO of Van City, and now the President and CEO of YVR. And all of those roles uh, offered their challenges uh, and great opportunity. But you know, I think this one, this one is going to be the best one yet. And it's not because we don't have our challenges, but because we have so much opportunity. I think right now I feel compelled to ask if you've got your seat belts fastened, your tray tables locked, seat backs in the upright position, because over the next 30 minutes, we're going to take you on a bit of a ride. On all the things that we've been doing at YVR, we have not let the pandemic slow us down. In fact, reflecting the best of our region and the best of what you bring as business leaders in support of us, we've been very, very busy. And so I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking to you about what we've been up to. But first, I thought it'd be maybe helpful for me to share with you my perspective on why I think YVR is so important. Why do we care about an airport beyond the movement of bags and goods? Why is an airport important, particularly now? given the unique place we're at in the world and what we see as our regional and national future. I came to YVR loving the airport. Like so many of you, it is simply a fantastic building. It represents the best of who we are, the color palette, the art, the feeling of openness and possibility. It is an absolutely stunning building which has been recognized 
internationally for being one of the best airports in the world year after year. And of course, it's all of those things. But it's also so much more. This time we're in, it's not an easy time, right? Despite the celebration that we have of coming back together, there's some challenges on the horizon. Still have a global pandemic, the war in Ukraine, economic uncertainty and the threat of a recession, geopolitical uncertainty, and of course, the rise of authoritarianism. All of these are challenges that would and could divide us. But yet, I think now is the time that we need to use the institutions, the organizations, and the parts of our economy and our business community that do the opposite of that. Actually call on us to come together, connect us, not only in person, not only in terms of making that next trip, but in much more uh, deep and profound ways that the support, the growth, the resiliency, the innovation, and the opportunity that is so much a part of our region. We need to grow, but we need to grow with diversity. We need to innovate, keeping the things that are important that got us here, but not losing sight of what we need to do differently in the future. And above all else, as we saw from the StatsCan data released just a couple of days ago, we must be a welcoming place for new citizens, for new ideas, for new businesses that help our economy thrive and prosper because we are a small economy and one that is uh, based on trade and that trade really ultimately needs the ideas and people from the global uh, world community. And so at YBR, as BC's airport, we have the opportunity to reflect those things, not just in our art and our building, which we will do and continue to do, but also in the way we do business, how we hire people, how we promote, how we de design business partnerships, how open we are to local firms as well as national firms, how we embrace reconciliation, how we digitize, how we take on the climate challenge that is a big one for an industry like aviation based as we are in fossil fuel. So part of what we've really been talking about at YVR over the past two years is how do we take the best of what we've been as the gateway to Asia Pacific and really look head on at the challenges that are before us as a region, as a business community and as leaders and build the kind of airport that we continue to be proud of because it's a beautiful building, but we also are deeply connected to because it's a, an essential part of our future and our growth together. I'd like to talk to you a little bit now about the year that was. We're going to be talking about how we've been uh, addressing the pandemic, what we've been doing, and the future. And today, it's all about that growth and connection. But first, I think it would be unfair if I didn't spend a little bit of time talking to you about this past summer, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, as you can see here, the screen gets a little darker. So, if you've traveled over the past several months, or you know someone who has, you would be forgiven for asking the question, you know, what the heck is going on with travel? We knew that there would be some bumpy parts of building back, but certainly we've seen some significant stresses across the entire global aviation system. Aviation is an ecosystem. You know, it is a supply chain of sorts. Every part is connected to the others. And so what happens in one place absolutely affects in others. It's like the opposite of Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? No. Uh, in aviation, everything is connected to everything else. And the pandemic really challenged our model. Aviation has built a world-class reputation and we have some very, very strong uh, air carriers and aviation partners here in Canada, world-recognized leaders for building a steady, predictable, reliable aviation model. The pandemic and the aftermath obviously challenged those assumptions. 
whether it was labor shortages and the need to retrain. You know, it can sometimes take two and three months to retrain basic uh, uh, security screening and service personnel, and of course, many, many months more for pilots and specific uh, mechanical and technical trades. The availability of goods, our ability to actually have the equipment uh, in order to support the people in those jobs. We are a victim of the supply chain as much as we are a part of it. And of course, the ever-changing international patchwork of COVID regulations and requirements made that, meant that we were designing models sometimes for two weeks at a time uh, before they would change again the subsequent two weeks and so on. And so our system, was really challenged from almost a virtual shutdown. I know we talk a lot about comparing to 2019, but I think when you think about where we started at the end of 2021, we were uh, all not really doing very much business. And so the traffic that came back, I think the Vancouver Sun called it revenge travel. That's not a phrase I would personally use, uh, <laughs> but certainly we saw a lot of volume coming back. Uh, that really challenged us. Pre-pandemic, my predecessor would stand up here. He would have said that they were and we were celebrating 2 and 3% annual growth as a kick it out of the ballpark year. In fact, that's the growth that we experienced at YVR uh, uh, over the course of the year from 2018 to 2019. In the past eight months, <laughs> since the beginning of January, where we had 25,000 daily passengers, we're pretty happy with that actually, 25,000, not bad given where we'd been. There was a time when that was a much, much lower number. Uh, but in August, 67,000 passengers uh, a day, a 168% increase in a few short months. Remember the context was we used to grow by two and 3% a year we grew 168% in a few short months. And so what happens when an aviation, or frankly any system, grows by 168% in a very short time? <laughs> it gets overwhelmed, right? Uh, and that's certainly what we saw at, uh, in aviation. And at YBR, you know, we had some challenges. I don't want to pretend that we didn't have our challenges. We certainly had some. But we didn't have nearly the number of challenges that other airports across the country and around the world uh, faced. And certainly <laughs> nothing as dramatic <laughs> as going uh, totally dark. What we did at the beginning of the pandemic uh, and when I arrived is we used it, you know the old saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We took that to heart and said, it's so not very many times in your career that you get an opportunity, in this case, a kind of a forced one, to look at an entire business end to end. Take those couple of steps back to say, you know, where could we improve? How are these things uh, working? Where are the weaknesses in order to take that next step forward? And that's what we absolutely did. We looked at everything from our historical assumptions to the resilience and ready, uh, readiness and sort of preparedness of various parts of our operation. We stopped some things and we made significant and brand new, never before investments in others. That all led to uh, some pretty significant decisions. For example, we did the very, uh, during the pandemic 2020, early 2021, we did the very unsexy, frankly, uh, work of looking at our dikes and our drainage. So we exist on a floodplain on Sea Island, so we had what I call the CEO's dikes and ditches tour, it's big sellout, very popular, <laughs> where we went and inspected all of the dikes surrounding Sea Island, uh, remediated them where they needed to be, and of course, dredged the ditches. That basic work meant that at about this time last year, when the atmospheric river hit our region, YVR was the only transportation node that was open continuously for 10 days straight, ensuring that goods, emergency personnel, and people could connect our region to the rest of the province. Everyone else was disrupted. 
We also focused on our role in the overall supply chain, digitizing how we move goods as well as how we move people. I'm going to talk a little bit about cargo uh, later. We also invested in our baggage infrastructure. Again, not a particularly sexy part of an airport, but as you now know, after this past summer, a very, very important one. And so what did we do? We took a look at our system. We used the slow time to test our assumptions back, forth, up, down, look at different ways of working, practice, tested, put new uh, systems in, repeat over and over again until we were confident that we were increasing the resilience and the performance of our baggage system. As an airport, one of the key things that we measure in terms of our performance is what we call our outbound baggage performance. That means, did the bag leave when it should, on the right plane, with the right passenger, to the correct destination? And I am very proud to say, as a result of the more fantastic work that our folks did during the pandemic, we can use and say the number 99%. That means each and every day, so far in 2022, including our busiest days in the summer, 99% of the time or more, our bags got out on time, where they're supposed to go, on the right plane, with the right passenger. I don't know of any other major airport on the continent that can make that claim. We continue to serve our community. We did, through partnerships that we had with Vancouver Coastal Health, Hamper Drive, with Quest Food Exchange, raising money through the tremendous and generous uh, community across the island for uh, Red Cross flood and fire relief, and doing the things that we did on just a very lovely and human scale of care packages for Ukrainian refugees. We created a new guest experience team, a team of 60 plus individuals speaking 32 different languages who are here to help along with our Greek green coats get our passengers on their way, returning to travel when many hadn't traveled for some time, navigating some of the processes that had changed during the pandemic. And I want to take a moment, I hope you saw our world famous green coats uh, greet you as, they, uh, as you came in today, just like they greet you when they come into the airport. Please join me in thanking them for the tremendous work they do as volunteers. Yeah, they're, they're simply fantastic. I can't tell you how many notes of appreciation I get for the services our volunteers provide. We also innovated and worked with partners in the business community. We partnered with Tech Resources to install copper surface finishes on all of the high-touch surfaces. You may know that uh, copper is antimicrobial, that is, it doesn't like uh, bacteria and, and microbes that are bad. It also has a lovely pink hue, and it is now across uh, our airport, and we're very pleased to do that. And for all of the work that we did, whether it was on our community service, whether it was on our protocols, whether it was on our cleaning surfaces, whether it was the way that we controlled air venting and controls in the airport, we were recognized with the COVID Award of Excellence. Yeah, thanks. I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I ever wanted to win an award for COVID. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this one is, uh, is one that really was uh, awarded by the international airport community. We're the only airport in Canada to receive that recognition because of the tremendous dedicated work that our folks did during the pandemic. We also had an opportunity, as you heard Brian say, to focus on improving the passenger experience. One of the things that we saw during COVID that I don't think is going to go back is while we were, you know, boarding passes is a great example. We used to have to think about every incentive possible to get people not to use those paper boarding passes with our airline partners. COVID came around like, ooh, I'm not touching a boarding pass. Uh, and so moving to digital and being more comfortable with digitization has definitely been something that we've seen. And so we've embraced that at the airport. As you saw, partnering with Canada Border Services on being able to pre-fill in your, your uh, customs declaration, reducing wait times at the border by 50%. We also have a new product called YVR Express. Think of it 
like the Disney Fast Pass system, you know, when you go to the front of the line at Disneyland, uh, except for for Katza. And so that allows, we're piling it in the uh, pre board screening for US transborder destinations, allows you to book online a dedicated place in line. You have uh, some certainty if you arrive at the airport at a certain time, you can be expedited through the CATSA line. That's proving to be very popular. Both of these things were piloted and developed at YPR. They're now being rolled out at airports across the country. We've also spent some time adjusting our food and retail bringing more local uh, culinary experiences and connecting more with the kind of food that, frankly, uh, people want to eat. We have some great uh, food offerings, and you know sometimes it's really important to just get something simple and go. Other times, people are looking for something a little bit different, whether it's vegetarian, whether it's ethnic cuisine, offered in a different way. And so we've been uh, partnering with local restaurants like Dirty Apron and Pacific Farms that features local brands like Purebred to bring the best, not only in the art and the color, but the best of local cuisine into our airport as well. And in the coming weeks, this one I'm super excited about, in the coming weeks in our international terminal, we'll be opening the first indigenous restaurant at any airport in, uh, in Canada. Uh, Salmon and Bannock will be opening in the international terminal, so we're super excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. We also created a volunteer effort in addition to our green coats, in addition to our guest experience, because there were some days there when it was pretty busy, as you know, uh, providing extra staff and support called the X team. The X team is simply a group of people who are back office functions. You know, many of you work with many of them. There are people in finance, there are people in HR, there are people in marketing, communications, IT, our Monday to Friday folks, we said, hey, you know, we could actually use some extra arms and legs on the floor. Is anybody interested? Another airport in Canada did a similar thing in the summer and got five volunteers. Uh, we, very large airport. We did the same, and we got 154 volunteers, creating thousands of extra hours in our airport simply because they wanted to be part of people moving through. So we will continue to run that program. It was so popular both with staff and passengers. So if you happen to see our CFO uh, park in your car, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all part of the team approach that we have at YBR. But at the same time, all of those operational things we did, you know, we found it was really important to keep it local and keep it human. And many people were traveling for the first time to see loved ones, parents, family that they had not seen in two plus years. People were making that first trip to university after being online, taking that first trip abroad, or meeting that really important business client for the first time. All things that can frankly be a little anxiety inducing. So we also took the time to really create human connections. Uh, you've experienced some of that here today. We've had the great privilege in the terminal and here in the room today of having the music from Kurt von Hahn on the piano, Steinway piano. Kurt, thank you. <laughs> oh, we can just dance now, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. <laughs> as well as just something small and special, uh, like a popsicle from Johnny's Pop, a local vendor who's had great success selling popsicles uh, around the Lower Mainland in parks and uh, in commercial venues. Please make sure he's here with us today. Please make sure you grab one on the way out. So that's really what we've been uh, doing on the operations and the innovation and the mobilization side, but how is that translated into passengers? So what does that all mean? How many are actually there? Where is it going? What do things look like? Well, you can see that uh, our passenger mix here from August in a minute. <laughs> uh, Canada, US, uh, international, you can see that we are not on an average uh, month yet exceeding our 2019 volumes. However, 
On individual days, particularly in domestic, we were actually at 104, 105, 106 percent of our pre-pandemic volumes for domestic. And for those of you who have traveled through the airport, you probably know that it's actually three distinct buildings, right? Three different terminals. And so we can't just mix and match exactly when passengers show up in different ways. So that's why you saw the volume in some areas of the airport while having uh, less volume in others. Been very, very pleased with the domestic recovery. U.S. recovery has also been very, very uh, strong, almost 80% of pre-pandemic. It's international where we see a little bit of a change in the picture from pre-pandemic levels. It's not that we don't have any international volume. We certainly do, particularly uh, to uh, Europe. But we're also seeing some good volumes in Asia with Japan, uh, Korea, and now uh, down to the South Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand as well. It's really China that has not returned at the volumes that it left. We expect China to be a part of our future, and we are absolutely planning for that, but we do not expect it to be as dominant a part of our mix as we have seen previously. You know, at our peak in 2018 and 2019, we had eight Chinese carriers uh, coming into YBR, sometimes as many as 22 flights uh, a day, many to secondary cities. I just don't see that returning for a variety of geopolitical and other reasons. But there's a lot to be excited about, and we see exceptional growth in the international markets just coming from a more diverse set of sources. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, the best part of that is we're going to be able to welcome those passengers to something else that was completed during the pandemic, finished in September of 2020. Normally, you all would have been invited out to this great grand opening, and we would have had cocktails and ribbon cutting and speeches, but it was a pandemic, and so we couldn't. But I'd like to show you uh, the absolutely stunning terminal that we have built uh, to expand our international gate capacity. It also highlights the best of British Columbia, color palette, indigenous art and language, a sense of place, and the best part, a living forest. So you can actually go out into the forest, which is open air uh, to the sky and the elements, probably not too popular today, uh, where you can get that last breath of West Coast air before getting on that long international flight. And so as a result of all of those things, we're on track to welcome about 17 million passengers in 2022. That's our forecast for this year. That's up from 7.1 million uh, last year. We think that will translate to about 22 million in 2023. And I think an interesting component of that 22 million next year, given where we're meeting uh, right here next to the cruise port, is we are forecasting a record never before seen number of cruise passengers coming through our airport next year. 1.4 million, higher than the 1.1 million by quite some margin uh, of the previous uh, levels. So it's interesting, right? In the depths of the pandemic, I'm not sure how many people would have predicted that cruise travel would have bounced back uh, to those levels. And that's all created as a result of the significant investments that our airline customer partners have been making in YVR. Air Canada, our largest domestic carrier, the largest carrier that serves a YVR, has made significant investments in our airport through the pandemic and continues to plan to do so going forward. They're growing the network between Asia and the Americas, and most services have been restored. Plus, there's some exciting new ones. Austin, Houston, Miami. Miami, I know, is particularly uh, popular. And they will be introducing service to Bangkok, the first uh, connecting point from North America to Thailand direct uh, of any airline in any airport on the continent. 
WestJet, also a big part of our success at YVR, is also making significant investments in our community and at our airport, and we're very pleased to support their Own the West strategy. Their recent partnership with Pacific Coastal Airlines will ensure that we connect the regions of our province in through YVR and out through the significant network that they have built into the U.S. As you know, our country is blessed with a large geography, but a small population. And so a healthy aviation system and a healthy aviation network is really important to be able to connect in particular rural and remote communities, including indigenous communities throughout our province and throughout the western part of the country. That's why we're very pleased to recently have announced our partnership with a new BC-based, 100% indigenous owned, woman-led and founded airlines, Iskwewo Air. Uh, and Tira Fraser, the CEO, who many of you know, is such a fantastic entrepreneur to have in our midst. You know, it's not for the faint of heart starting an airline, particularly starting an airline after a global pandemic. I think it was Richard Branson who was once asked, how do you become a millionaire? And he said, well, you start as a billionaire and then you launch an airline. So it's, uh, we're very excited to be supporting a uh, local entrepreneur. We also have opportunities to maintain and grow service connectivity throughout British Columbia and throughout the country. Some growth that's been coming to our airport from Flair Airlines, from Lynx, and Canada Jetline will be launching its first service uh, from YVR to Toronto in December. We also welcomed a number of new airlines for the first time. So people are investing in our airport in ways they didn't pre-pandemic. And so what do we see there? Sun Country, Fiji, I know that's gonna be very popular with many, and JetBlue Airlines, very uh, famous US airline, the first uh, uh, port airport in Canada that they are serving. So lots of exciting growth in our air services. But now, let's take a moment and reflect a little bit on what that looks like in the future. We've built back, we've innovated, we've made our way through in an operation sense. Where are we making investments to ensure that we're here to, supo to support you and your businesses and also the regional growth that so many of us rely on and are a part of going forward? We've been working really on six main things, and they're the kinds of things I think that probably many of you have been working on in your own businesses. Reconciliation, how we use our land, the movement of goods and trade, climate, digitization and technology, and of course, where is our future labor going to come from, and the needed investment in skills development and our people. How we think about these things not only affects us, but affects our region, and in fact, our country. And one of the things that we've learned during the pandemic is you really can't go back. So we need to lean into these things, build on our strength to ensure that we're resilient and prosperous in service of you uh, in the future. One of the things that's very important to us, and you heard Chief Sparrow speak about it, um, we speak about it quite often, is the fact that we are located on Sea Island, which is the traditional unceded and continuously occupied territory of Musqueam. Five years ago, YVR entered into an historic agreement, the first of its kind in the country, a friendship and sustainability agreement, a 30-year agreement that actually set forward a path on how we would embed reconciliation in everything we did, whether it was language, culture, employment, economic opportunities, opportunities for partnership and growth, all of those are a key part of everything we do at YVR. But there's one story, I think, it's not a very well-known one, that I thought I might share with you on how this partnership has really contributed to our region and is a reflection, I think, of the best of who we are. You probably know that over the last two years, we at YVR have welcomed over uh, two dozen charter flights with refugees coming to our country, largely, from Afghanistan and now Ukraine. 
These are people who come to our country and to our region not by choice, but by circumstance. They're vulnerable, displaced, separated from family members, facing an uncertain future. When our colleagues at Musqueam heard that we had charter flights uh, coming into the airport, they did the most basic and yet most remarkable thing. Elders from Musqueam insisted on coming and greeting each and every charter flight regardless of what time of day it flew into our airport to welcome refugees to our community and to our airport in a good way. They spent time to welcome women, children, elderly, and to say that as the first peoples of our land, they not only belonged, but there, had, there was hope for their future. The number of refugees who commented that that was unlike anything they have experienced in the several years, in some cases, leading up to their very difficult journey and choice to leave their homeland was absolutely amazing. And so, you know, we do land acknowledgements. We talk about connection. But what we see through our partnership is creating connection and support in ways that are so basic, yet so profound, in terms of setting those folks up for the kind of livelihoods and connection to our community that we hope for when we welcome them as refugees. And I really just want to take a moment to acknowledge Musqueam and to thank them for their thoughtful, quiet, but so impactful work in welcoming refugees to our airport. Chief Sparrow, thank you. That brings me to our land and how we use it. I think you may have heard that for the first time in 30 years, we have changed our land use plan. Uh, we have uh, looked at everything we do, how we've set aside land, and feel that in really any scenario that we plan for, uh, including uh, growing to 40 and 50 million passengers, that we have enough capacity in the airport if we use technology, we use better management protocols, and we use greater partnerships to be able to serve what we have today and what we see into the future all the way for the next 50 years into 2072. That gave us the opportunity then to think about the land that we had previously set aside for a third runway and for uh, parts of a third runway that may have needed to be extended into the ocean, something I think frankly had a low probability of occurring or being approved. And we were able to free that land up for development, for service to the airport, but more importantly, for regional development. That means that we have 400 acres in the north of industrial zone land located in Metro Vancouver. And if you've heard my colleague uh, Robin Sylvester speak, you know how important industrial land is to supply chain in our region. It also freed up another 800 acres in the south for further densification to serve logistics and cargo as well as other uses. That translates into a developed value of about $8 billion that we have freed up in service of our community. That was approved by local governments, approved by the federal governments, and received unanimous approval from Musqueam as well. We also thought about the land and the new ways to support cargo. Cargo's been a bit of a, a silent but very important part of the airport business over these last two years, and in fact was more resilient, as you might imagine, due to e-commerce and supply chain uh, changes part of our business model, cargo up 16%. We've been able to invest in our cargo operations, historically, frankly, a place that the airport authority did not invest in enough to be able to bring technology to make sure that the inefficiencies that we sometimes see in the way that we've set up our services for our partners like DHL, FedEx, and CargoJet, to move from analog a guy waiting for a box, a box waiting for a guy waiting for a truck, a box waiting for a guy waiting for a truck for an aircraft to digital. Uh, Sensor-based, AI, data-driven, dispatch just in time, reducing our GHGs, but also significantly improving our efficiencies and our throughput. 
We partnered with Calais Information Solutions, uh, first partnership of its kind uh, in the country to bring that digitized solution to life. We've also created a, a climate plan that focuses on our opportunity to be a leader. Aviation, fossil fuel driven industry, difficult to decarbonize. Airports can play a bigger role though than I think people think in terms of what we can do. We provide the platform that allows aircraft to take off and land. Through our partnership with Navigation Canada, we can control the ascent and descent, just like your car. Do you use fuel, do you not fuel, use fuel up and down uh, when uh, aircraft take off and land? And of course, we can control what kind and help them control what kind of fuel is put into those aircraft, as well as whether they're able to plug into the electrical grid uh, when they're in the airport. And so all of these things have come together in a unique partnership that we have signed with the Port of Seattle, which runs the Marine Port and the airport, and the Port of Portland, which also runs the Marine Port and the airport, sharing knowledge and infrastructure on the movement of sustainable aviation fuel, which as you probably know, moves north to south, actually in our region, not, not so much east to west, and sharing innovations around electrification of the uh, air side operations, as well as uh, how we do energy retrofit in the significant buildings and facilities that we operate. We also have a plan, the first of its kind in North America, again, to be net zero by 2030. 2030 sounds like a long way away, but we're already well on our path. Whether it is uh, using geo-exchange facilities, whether it's using sensor controls to think about HVAC controls in our building, whether it's thinking about the lighting that we use and how we change that up, significant number of lights in, uh, in the airport, as you might imagine, and also looking at other things in the future, carbon capture, big land base, uh, battery storage, all things that can be piloted and tested at YVR, just like our digital solutions, and then uh, rolled out for the betterment of airports uh, across British Columbia. We have a great partnership with uh, the British Columbia Aviation Council to support decarbonization at smaller airports and also to airports across the country. For our efforts in this area, uh, YVR achieved a level four plus airport carbon accreditation. I didn't know what that was either, but uh, in airport speak, it's the highest level of accreditation that is uh, recognized, given to airports and our operations around the world by our international uh, authority. And we're very pleased to be recognized for our leadership in that area. We also know though that the future of growth must be digital. We have this fantastic piece of infrastructure. How can we improve the way we use it, how we understand it, how we plan for it by creating uh, a marriage with digital technology? One of the things we did in the uh, pandemic was also to create something called a digital twin. Digital twin is a full digital replica of our airport inside and out. That allows us to see things and do things and plan for things and measure things in ways that were not possible before. YVR is only one of four airports worldwide to have uh, made this kind of investment. So I'd like to show you a little bit this is the cool part of the presentation. Show you a little bit of what it looks like. This is the kind of quality that we have through the digital twin. You can see that we can measure everything from what's on the gate to what's on the airfield. We can also do some of those, pardon me, carbonized and decarbonized flight paths by taking a look at the ascent and descent of aircraft. We can think about how we move people through the airport, we can uh, take a look at our uh, significant uh, art collection and got some really interesting work uh, happening on uh, creating digitized tokens for the metaverse of our airport in consultation and with the approval of our artists. But it's the coolest thing about it, I'll tell you, is not just what you see on the screen, it's that what you see on the screen is actually also in my hand. And so what I'm looking at here is the same image that you look at there. And we have a live feed for the operations of our airport. That allows us to plan where we've got lineups, where we've got queues, where we need to allocate different resources, where we can pilot different innovations to help people move more uh, efficiently, help bags and goods move more efficiently through our airport. And the greatest part is it's not just in my hand, because kind of 
maybe a little wasted in the CEO's hands, but it's in every single uh, palm of every single employee's hands right across our airport. This is the innovation in partnership with many local companies who are here in the room with us this afternoon that has given us the ability to really outperform most other airports uh, in the country. We also know that we can have all the cool tech in the world, but it doesn't really mean anything without our people. Uh, and so we have really been uh, struggling as a sector, as you know, to ensure that we had the right people in the right place, doing the right work, with the right training, at the right time. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that YVR, I think we sort of understood that that might be a risk um, a little earlier than, than uh, maybe we could have, and some others did. And so as a result, we've been making significant investments in our people and their support uh, for several, uh, several months and almost virtually since the day I arrived. Some 26,500 people work at YVR, making us one of the largest work sites in the entire province. And I'm very pleased to say that earlier this year, we were recognized as a certified living wage employer, the first and only airport in the country to have that designation. Yeah, thank you. So in closing, hopefully what you've heard here today explains a little bit of what you saw in the summer, gives confidence to the way that we've approached programs, and also makes clear the thing that I think is most important about running an airport and why I absolutely love the job that I have, notwithstanding I took it during the pandemic. And that is, running an airport is the ultimate team sport. Nothing that we do can be done by a single one of us. It must be done through connections and partnership with each other across the airport, but most importantly, with all of you. Whether it's via travel, by helping you serve your business and meet your uh, clients, whether it's the significant work that we do in the construction and world-leading trades that we have in our region to build the airport, whether it's partnership with the dozens, hundreds, thousands of small business owners, from taxi cab operators to freight forwarders to uh, people who are running food and beverage retail and retail outlets in our airport, we can do nothing if we're not working in partnership with all of you. Our significant and historic and impactful partnership with Musqueam, of course, is a key part of all we do. We also partner with communities, with local governments, with provincial government, with federal governments, to make sure that we are delivering on the kind of value that you need, that our region needs, in order to thrive and prosper. You know, in short, it's a great privilege to live and work in Vancouver in our region. And it's a great privilege to be the president and CEO of such an important institution like YVR. But, you know, there's an old African proverb. You've probably heard it. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. At YVR, we're in the go far business. So I'm absolutely delighted that we can do that together. Thank you so much for your time and attention this afternoon. We're so looking forward to continuing this conversation with you in the future. Thank you so much for your support. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.